great. All right, so again, thank you for doing this. And yeah, well, you're welcome. Let me go and, uh, straighten the jacket out just a bit. Okay, here we go. Um, I understand from I tried to try to do my homework before this, and what I understand is that your mother was a musician and your father was uh, an engineer, and it just seems so perfect because the sort of work that you do involves elements of both of those things, right? right. No, I mean, um, yes, my mother was a loved music, you know, loved music, and my, my dad was really a very good inventor. Um, and so, of course, like all things, I couldn't follow in his footsteps. I mean, it just becomes sort of this impossible thing. Um, but I think my sort of love for technology and etc. came from him. And knowing, you know, you know, sort of having a, having a freedom to think about technology as well in the context of music which is, in one way or the other, all about technology, because, you know, the question I'm always being asked is, you know, the, the, the electronics and orchestras, you know, putting those together. Well, that's not a very um, adventurous idea, because, uh, because all instruments are technology in one way or the other. Hmm. I mean, the piano is an amazing piece of technology. It's just a, a piece of technology of its time, and now we're in some post-industrialist computer electronic age, so why shouldn't the uh, why shouldn't we augment the orchestra? Why shouldn't we augment our instruments? Was music something? I know that your mother was herself talented, but was that something that was really a part of your childhood? Were you uh, were you given lessons? Were you, how did yeah, you? Yeah, well, uh, I spent my childhood really. I I I, I had these. I had, you know, oddly strict parents, but they were very strict about only two things. One was they were staunch pacifists, so um, which I absolutely couldn't understand as a kid because every boy wants a toy gun. So, <laughs> did, did, you know, I, I, you know, I lost out on that. And then the other thing I lost out on was television because they thought television was, you know, like the end of civilization as we know it. And it's only in retrospect that I realized, you know, what sort of a great sacrifice they made themselves by never having a television to so, you know, because, you know, once it's in the house, it's in the house. I mean, um, so I had two things. I had um, books and I had music. I mean, we had a piano and um, music was always being played and we would always go to concerts and stuff like this. Um, people would come and play at the house. It was great. And Really, you know, when I got bored with reading, I'd go and play some music, or you know, I'd I wasn't playing, you know. I mean, it's you know, I, I would go and bash around on the piano and enjoy the racket it made. And just around the corner from us lived this really remarkable man um, in a 16th century tower, and he was a re um, restorer of cathedrals. He did Strasbourg, he did Cologne, and somehow in his travels, he had managed to persuade Con, however he got to it, uh, a church out of its 2,500 pipe church organ. And so there was, right next to where we lived, this medieval tower with a huge church organ in it, and I could go over there every day and just unleash the beast. <laughs> and while well, everybody thought it was just a terrible racket I was making, this man thought, you know, he would talk to my mother about, you know, my my adventurous harmonic sense and all that stuff. It wasn't an adventurous harmonic sense. It's what kids do, you know, when I was four, five, six years old or whatever. But I'd go there, I'd go there all the time. And then, um, just before my sixth birthday, my father died. And really, music stuff then became a much larger part of my life and stuff like that. It was the perfect refuge. And, and you know, it's, you, you, you know, it was one of the few things that would put a smile on my mother's face if I sat down and played the piano. And she actually eventually said, you know, do you want to get a piano teacher? And I thought, because, you know, children think with a different logic, but it's a logic nonetheless, um, that I was hearing all this stuff in my head and this guy would, you know, teach me how to express it. And of course, that's not at all what a piano teacher does. What a piano teacher does is he gets you to learn your scales and lets, gets you to learn other people's music. 
So I rebelled against this within moments, you know, and, and the, so the formal education lasted for two weeks, and it was, it was truly, it was a bloodbath. So know. the rest was just self-taught? But, well, it's not entirely self-taught, because music is, you know, music takes, you know, the, it, it really works best in a community. So if you, you know, like at school, we had a little band, you know, we were playing, you know. I mean, m music serves different functions at different times, you know. So, but, but you know, when I was a kid feeling lonely, I would take refuge in it. By the time I, you know, I was 13 or 14, I mean, it was an amazing tool to attract the other sex. I mean, you know, um, other boys had the gift of the gab, you know, and I could just sit down on the piano and, do that. Yes. So, um, and I think there are very few musicians, if you if you ask them honestly, that that didn't at one point or the other just go and misuse their talent, you know, <laughs> as a means of seduction. Yeah. Um, but and and really that that thing, you know, that happens when you have four people sitting in a room and we're just you know just playing rock and roll or we're playing the blues. I don't know why. In Germany, every kid wanted to play the blues. You know, um, I I, th I think because one of the major influences on all of us was um, uh, American Forces Network, which was the army radio station. Mm -hmm. And, you know, none of us listened to German radio, but I remember hiding my little transistor radio under my pillow at night, you know, and <laughs> listening to... Wolfman Jack play rock and roll to us, you know, <laughs> and, and hearing Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin and uh, hearing all that stuff, um, you know, and then eventually, I mean, you know, and, and that's all I did. I was, I was, I, I'm truly an academic failure. Um, because what I would do is I'd sit in these classes with 35 kids and, you know, I'd try to not be in the sideline of the teacher and I just daydream you know <laughs> and um, which is not how you pass exams so <laughs> I I moved schools a lot shall we say you know eventually I ran out of schools in Germany and I went to Switzerland and I finally ended up in England mm -hmm. because I love being in England because it was all about rock and roll and um, I never went back and I, I never went back to Germany I mean I, I, I went back after I left school and tried to get a few jobs in television, you know, please let me write some music for your not very good television show. Mm -hmm. and of course, they didn't want me because I hadn't gone to the Musik Academy. <laughs> I didn't have the right papers and the right qualifications. And so, um, luckily, that didn't work out. Yes. So I, so I stayed in England. And, and I, how did it happen that you started... I believe producing and, and in some cases also performing uh, for music videos and advertisements. Was that in England? That was in England. I mean, I was in a band, you know, the, the way everybody's in a band. Um, you know, going up and down the motorways, playing working men's clubs. It was, it was, the, it was late 70s, beginning of the 80s. And um, it, was, it, was, it was a really interesting time because it was, you know, it was punk and the same time Margaret Thatcher was in government and, and all these towns we would go to I mean the, you know like Nottingham or Sunderland which was the shipyards and the shipyards had been shut down or you know we would go to the mining towns and the mines had been shut down and there were endless strikes and there was so it was a, t it was a time of enormous political upheaval and I was in this little band we never had a record deal but we, we, we managed to make a living um, and I suppose if I look, you know, if I look back at, on it, you know, it was a, you know, it was a pathetic living, you know. Um, I mean, you know, I, I just lived off McDonald's, and, you know, whatever the cheapest food was, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever that was. So it's all, you know, it's, it's your normal Spinal Tap story. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, Spinal Tap is the best and most truthful documentary on rock and roll ever made, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day, uh, you know, we, we had this deal with this recording studio where we could use the 
the off hours, which usually was from 10 o'clock at night till 10 in the morning or something like this. Um, and during the day, they did a lot of commercials, etc. And um, this woman, Maggie Rodford, who worked for George Martin, she had a company with George, um, asked the engineer if he knew anybody who was good at this strange beast, the synthesizer. <laughs> and he said, well, there's this kid who's, you know, spends all night in here. Um, and she asked, you know, I met her and she asked me, you know, what I was doing Monday and Thursday and Friday and you know, you know, usually, you know, uh, part of the musician's lot is you're so used to people promising you things or promising you work and they never phone you back. So, you know, I, I didn't think anything was going to happen. And sure enough, Monday, I was doing a session and I remember, I, to this day, I remember exactly what the check looked like and <laughs> her signature, you know, because it was the first time I, somebody actually paid me for doing music uh, properly. Um, and I left the band and I started doing commercials and I met a lot of really great people through that. I met Stanley Meyer through that, um, uh, Richard Harvey, I mean an enormous amount of, uh, and, and, and of course it was a time when great English filmmakers were making commercials, you know, the Scott Brothers, Hugh Hudson, um, Alan Parker, Nick Rogue, so suddenly, you know, I'd, I, I was involved with um, filmmakers, and, mm -hmm. and I became sad. And, well, hang on, there was a, like a sort of a, sort of a side thing. Sure, you sure. know, I, I joined. Didn't really join, but you know, I had some friends who were making a record, and I was sort of part of that. And it became it was, it was just before my twenty-first birthday. It sort of became a number one hit, and. Um, Again, in best spinal tap fashion, you know, everything went sort of pear shaped and wrong. And we, you know, we, did, we, we were doing really good until we had a hit record, and then suddenly, you know, it, it, like all hell break, breaks loose. Can because, we state for the record which this which this was? The, well, it was video killed the radio yes, star. Yes. You know, we were somewhat prophetic. Um, it was really Trevor Horn's baby and Jeff Downs, but. Uh, you know, you know, life goes crazy because you have a, you have a. I remember we we had a number one record, but we were still trying to push start Jeff's car, because having an, everybody was assuming we were rich, mm -hmm. but we you know we hadn't seen any money, yeah. you know, um, and so I was uh, doing my commercials and stuff like this, Jeff Jeff and Trevor were doing sessions and producing other things. Um, and then we had to do an album, you know, a long playing something or the other, but all we had was this one song, mm -hmm. really. <coughs> and I realized really quickly what, 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 what they wanted was for us to just do the same thing as we did on that song. Um, and I suddenly realized that that was far, far more tedious than even, you know, because the commercials were actually quite interesting, you know, because you... You could move around in styles. You were working with interesting filmmakers. You were doing new things all the time. And and again, because of the period, things were really being pushed. Um, so I sort of became Stanley Myers' assistant, who was a great film composer and a great intellect, and uh, really took really 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 took me under his wing. You know, really showed me how the orchestra worked, and I spent. I mean, I spent years learning things from him, and he was incredibly generous because he would let me ha be in these meetings straight away. I mean, the first, you know, proper meeting on a film I think I was ever in was with Nic Nicholas Rogue, and it was just—it was just a different world. The conversation was on a different level, um, and I liked the idea. I mean, even Video Killed the Radio Star is. is it's not just your normal love song. It tries to tell a story. And I loved this idea mm -hmm. that you could tell stories with music. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I loved the idea of combining images and music. And so I think we lost something when we figured out how to do recording and separate the eye watching the performer from the audio. You know, recording is a very different... I mean, Trevor Horn is an amazing producer because he's one of the people who really truly understands that mm -hmm. you know it's a it's a very different thing going to a concert and seeing somebody than listening to it 
you know, on the iPod. Uh-huh. Um, Those films that you made with Stanley, the, my, am I beautiful. correct? Beautiful Andrade and number Moon of lighting, um, Eureka, a lot, a lot of Nick Rogue stuff. Yeah. Um, well, uh, my beautiful Andrade, I suppose, is the sort of most important one because it was made with um, oh, no, a couple of people. Sarah Radcliffe and Tim Bevan, mm-hmm. um, who'd been doing music videos up till that moment. And we all sort of decided, oh, we're going to go and do a movie. And Stephen Frears was the only one who sort of understood how to make <laughs> a movie. Um, and that, of course, became working title. And, um, you know, like to the, to the, my life just turned full circle because, you know, we were doing Rush. It was just like being back in the old days, you know, working with. <laughs> the working title yeah. crew and um, weirdly nothing had changed you know <laughs> and the energy was the same and the enthusiasm was the same and the just of, the sort of recklessness oh yeah. come on let's let's make a movie you know <laughs> all that and the first time that you independently scored a movie would have been A World Apart A World Apart A World Apart for working title and isn't that just to, amazingly, how, how the dots connect, isn't that uh, what brought you to the attention of Barry Levinson for Rain Man? Um, yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I did I did a world apart because, number one, I loved it. Number two, they were my friends. Number three, I wanted to do a movie all by myself. I don't think I slept throughout the whole period, mm. just from nerves. And then um, Barry Levinson's wife, Diana Hurt, saw the movie and she bought him the CD uh, that's the thing before downloads <laughs> um, after the black things right. um, and she, she she bought him the CD and he was working on Rain Man and he really liked it and um, he was in London promoting uh, Good Morning Vietnam and he didn't have my phone number or anything but somehow had the address to my little studio and so one evening 11 o'clock at night there's a knock on the door <laughs> and there's a guy standing there going hi my name's Barry Levinson I'm a director from Hollywood <laughs> or something like that yeah. and I'm going yeah you and my mom both <laughs> um, but then I sort of look behind him and down our tiny little alley um, are two enormous limos sort of squashed <laughs> And, you know, London isn't a place where you have enormous limos. And so I thought, oh, maybe maybe there's something to this guy. And I sort of <laughs> invited him in, and we started talking, and I showed him how I worked. And, you know, he sort, of, he sort of said, you know, would I come and, you know, would I consider going to Hollywood and doing this movie with him? And, you know, of course I said yes. And I didn't really know anybody over here, so... Um, and you had some this, reservations, right? Sounds, from what I've read, like you weren't so sure this is a, a terrific place to be for a young artist. Well, no, 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 really, really. My whole thing was that, um, of course I wanted to come to Hollywood. Of course I wanted to come and do those movies that I loved uh, and be part of that. But I didn't want to go until somebody asked me, somebody, I, uh, until I had a proper job, some, mm-hmm. a job offer. Mm-hmm. Because I really... Um, this is amazing shot in electric light and blue, the, the the very last shot where the camera just pulls back and back and back and back and this endless road in Monument Valley. And to to a European it was just wow, this this country is so big, this is so endless, I can be you know, I'll just get lost. You know, I didn't want to come to Los Angeles and be lost and just be another really, really bad waiter and uh, so arriving with you know, with a you know, with something to do, with actually work to do, uh-huh. was great. And um, I didn't know where to work, so I did you know, did the whole score in Barry's office, um, which he really liked, and it actually it, it actually be- became you know sort of my favorite way of working. Uh-huh. That the cutting room and the composer are in the same place, yeah. you know, and, and we just sort of exchange ideas, and you know, we we you know. The one, the, you know, the music informs the cut, and the cut informs uh-huh. the music, you know, in a very sort of organic way. And uh, you know, I, I know Barry really liked that uh, that way of working. Sure. 
And it, it, it does seem that once you were here, and even in the period immediately before you were here, you sort of had this amazing streak, really hit the ground running, because from from what I understand, you uh, were a score producer on The Last Emperor, you then do Rain Man, and you do Driving Miss Daisy. That's back-to-back-to-back Best Picture winners. It's pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, actually, uh, Last Emperor is very, very much... Well, I was sort of there helping out, picking up the pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a... Let me put it that way. It was a really international production where nobody spoke the same language. <laughs> and, it, 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 and, and, and luckily, I could straddle some of those languages, where, for instance, Kung Su, a Chinese composer, would speak to me in German because he had studied in Berlin. Mm-hmm. And I knew uh, Richi Sakamoto from um, the Yellow Magic Orchestra from my sort of rock and roll mm-hmm. days. So... You know, we had that, and I knew Jeremy Thomas, the producer. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So somehow I was the right guy to sort of... Bridge the, yeah. Yeah, bridge many gaps. Yeah. And um, uh, poor David Byrne, I just shoved him up into my <laughs> office because I, we'd run out of space in the studio, and, you know, um, I sort of ignored him most of the time because <laughs> he seemed pretty self-sufficient, <laughs> you know? Uh, it, and, and after these... this string of early success here I, I imagine suddenly your fear of coming here and having nothing to do was probably quickly gone because I, and I think people were uh, or even if the fear wasn't gone the reality was that I, I believe pretty quickly after that you were in demand and so that begs the question that I, I always wonder because you you I, I think anybody would like to work with you at this point and so the question is how do you decide whether or not to take on a specific film are well, there it was it was all pretty simple. I mean, I mean, look, I could tell you. I mean, if you're talking about those movies, I can tell you exactly what happened. So, mm-hmm. you know, finished Rain Man, went back to England, got an Oscar nomination. Oh, wow, that's pretty exciting! So I came over for the Oscar lunch. So I had a, you know, I had a lunch mm-hmm. and a week of hanging out. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ridley Scott was in town, so I had breakfast with him. And I said, you know, what are you, what are you up to? And he's he said, you know, well, I'm working on this Black Rain movie. It's about Japan and this and that and the other. And, and we just started having ideas. He goes, hey, do you want to do it? Um, I said, sure. You know, and, and I think that afternoon I met the Xanax just because um, I loved the play. I loved Driving Miss Daisy yeah. uh, as a play. And um, it was of the same conversation. Do you have any ideas? And I, I, I did have an idea. I mean, I had a... I, you know, like with Ridley, that com- I didn't know what he was doing, but we developed an idea mm-hmm. pretty much during this breakfast. You know, with the Xanax, I came in with an idea, and I think at the end of the day, the, the whole point is, you know, if you if if you have an idea, people, it, it's wonderful because yeah. people really want to listen. You know, the, 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 they they like you having ideas, and then. What did I do after that? I, oh, I did Days of Thunder with Tony. And Tony was just, you know, an old friend. Mm-hmm. You know, Tony actually offered me my first movie ever in Hollywood, except his producer went, Hans Who. Um, <laughs> Which would that have? That was uh, um, Top Gun or Revenge. something? Revenge. Revenge, yeah. Revenge. Um, but Tony talked um, Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer into meeting me, and they were shooting in Daytona Beach, and I flew down to Daytona for this quick meeting, and by the end of the meeting, they, you know, they went, "Yeah, great, you know, but the problem is, you know, we we are under real time pressure. You can't go back to London or you can't go back to LA, but it's it'd be much more efficient if we built you a studio right here." <laughs> I'm going, but look, I'm wearing one. I got one T-shirt. They go, ah, don't worry, wardrobe's going to take care of that, um, and and they did. Yeah. Trust me, they truly did. You know. <laughs> Um, and that was the beginning of a ongoing still uh, relationship. Right? Yeah, you know, and and uh, but but you know, you, so you're asking how do you pick how do you pick them? And you know, with Tony, it was obvious. Tony was a friend. Mm-hmm. You know, um, he was a dangerous friend because he would always ask the impossible, um, put you on a ledge, and give you a good shove, and. Um, It was always an adventure, mm-hmm. but, but 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 you know. But the thing was, 
we always had a laugh. Yeah. And so, and actually I never thought about this, but if you think about it, so these first movies, other than Barry Levins, mm -hmm. they were all with foreigners, mm -hmm. you know, so Ridley being English. So, you know, um, yeah, five o'clock, you know, come on, let's have a martini, and <laughs> then we carry on. Um, the, uh, you know, Bruce Beresford, Australian, sure. um, Tony, Ridley's brother. Yeah. Um, my God, did we do so? You know, we got up to some really crazy times together. Absolutely. So it was all about the adventure, really. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing for me was, you know, I'd, I'd heard all these things about, you know, how difficult Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer would be. And I sort of had this thought that if I could survive them, I could survive anything. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, it turns out that they were complete gentlemen. I mean, you know, there, there, there was like a form to, you know, this, they built me the studio in, the, in this really bad neighborhood um, <laughs> in, in an old AT&T building. Um, and literally, at one, you know, one day there was like a gun battle going on. Yes, <laughs> the police were chasing. You know, it was, it was like sort of a druggy neighborhood. There were bullet holes in, oh in, my in God. <laughs> Jerry's office window. But there's like a there's a, like a chase going on <laughs> through our cutting rooms. Um, but you know, and they'd come in and I'd play them something, mm -hmm. and then there'd be like a twenty second silence, and then either Don or Jerry would come out with this very articulate sentence about the piece of music and, and finally I went hang on a second what's with the silence always <laughs> and Don said to me look we know you've put a lot of work into this so we just feel we we need to think before we speak uh -huh. you know out of respect uh -huh. and, 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 and I went hang on that's that's not the guys I heard about uh -huh. so that's really how they worked uh -huh. And, you know, and I think if you ask anybody on those crews, you know, if you ask anybody on a Tony Scott crew, I mean, we would have gone, and we did, because uh -huh. he made us go to the end of uh -huh. the earth. You know what I mean? My first conversation with Tony was, hey, man, do you ride motorcycles? Actually, no, I don't. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'll take you. We'll go, we'll go into the desert. We'll listen to the desert. I mean, you know, it was like, hey, you've ever... You've ever gone parachute jumping? No, Tony, I don't really want to. <laughs> oh, no, 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 come on. So, you know, suddenly I'm finding myself, I'm tied to some instructor jumping out of a plane, <laughs> you know. Um, and this was so somehow all in service of, you know, let's find the tone for the movie, right. you know. <laughs> well, you say, you talk about the importance of the idea, how people respond to the idea. And this may be an impossible question to answer, but... In your experience, where, uh, what are the sources of your inspiration, of your ideas? Do you find that it, it's ever, uh, is it you know, dreams, is it uh, experiences? Where, where do they come from? Um, myths, fairy tales, um, psychology. Um, it's always the conversation with the director. Mm -hmm. It's always the conversation with the director. Um, because while you're listening to him telling you the story of what he was trying to make and he's telling you the, the film, you know, you're si sitting there desperately trying to come up with the thing that he can't say in words or images. Um, plus you think about things in a different way. You know, you may, a musician will focus on, on, on something that resonates for a musician. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so you, you, you try to find the soul of the movie. And you try to figure out how to express that in a, you know, maybe in a way that hasn't been done before. You know, um... You've done that a lot, though, in, in by coming up with sounds that didn't even, hadn't existed, right? Well, I think, I think that there's sort of two types of composers. There's the composer who... You know, m m maybe because he has an academic background or something like that. So he's trying to find his voice, or he's wor he's constantly working on his voice and developing his style. You know, while with me, it's just complete anarchy. I'm going, you know, <laughs> look at the stuff I did with Ridley. I mean, Gladiator sounds really different from Thelma and Louise, you know. Thelma, you know, 
hey, let's go and do, let's get this great blues guitar player in and, you know, let's, let's go there and let's not have an orchestra. Um, just because I, th I thought it was appropriate for this movie and because I was interested in it. Um, it's the old Duke Ellington thing, you know, where, where he said there are only two types of music, good music and bad music, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, if, if you want me to do a country and western psychedelic heavy metal album, I'll do it. You know, because, <laughs> whoa, yeah, we haven't, you know, we, ha we haven't tried. And sometimes I fail and sometimes I, I need saving. And um, one of the things which I think is sort of extraordinary about Hollywood is, is that um, they know you need to push the envelope and sometimes it will fail and mm -hmm. they will be there to help you. I mean... I did a movie called Power of One for Arnold Milton and Steve Ruther, mm -hmm. and I had this idea that I wanted to do it all on choirs. And I was doing, you know, the movie was about Africa, and and so here I was working with all these choirs, and it just sounded like church music. Um, and I'd spent a lot of money by that point, and I, and I went to see Steve and Arnold, and I said, Doc. Guys, I'm really sorry, but I don't think it's working. And their original idea was, oh, it's about Africa. Can't you do something like Out of Africa with mm -hmm. the Lush Orchestra? Mm -hmm. And I said, I think I'll go and do your first idea. And and they said, no, we love your idea. The only mistake you're making is you're not in Africa. Mm -hmm. And this was on a Thursday, and on Monday I was in Africa wow. with an amazing choir. Yeah. You know, so this idea of putting forward some whatever it is, you know, and then actually having people that that support you in, 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 in and I need a lot of support, mm -hmm. I need a lot of help, um, actually making that come true. I, I, th I think that's a remarkable thing mm -hmm. about this industry. Mm -hmm. Is there, is th this may be a, another, maybe this one's a little silly, but is there, a do you have a favorite sound? Oh God! If you knew what was going through my head, it's just, uh, <laughs> like um, not really. I mean, the, the, you know, it's it's like look, look what's going through my head. It's, I think I always wanted to do. I would just always wanted to drop a piano off a really tall skyscraper <laughs> and have and just have a microphone inside and the the, the wind. Go, you know, vibrating those strings. You know, I, I don't know. You that know, would be so, interesting. Um, haven't quite done that yet. Yes. Um, <laughs> Jerry Bruckheimer should be able to make that. We, well, we destroyed <laughs> a piano on Sherlock, but, you know, in, in Fox's underground car park. Right. You know, it's, um, well, this year alone, uh, I, I've i lost count of how many movies. I think five movies this year. I know Rush, Lone Ranger, 12 Years a Slave, uh, Man of Steel. What's what's the fifth? I I, I just lose there count. Isn't the fifth? Is it's the four? I think I think that's it. The four. Okay. You know, I try not to look back because you know it just it just shows that you you know I didn't get enough sleep. Well, this is this is what I, oh. you're, this is exactly what I want to ask you about because you I think at this point have nothing left to prove to to anyone but yourself unless you want to you know and I just wonder why do you push yourself. As hard as you do, and remain as prolific as you are. Well, partly because it's not work, is it? It's play. I mean, we play music, and I like dragging the director in. You know, it's like in in a funny way. Even though he doesn't play an instrument, he's sort of part of the band, and it's that whole. You know, I mean, those projects. You know, like um, Man of Steel was great because you know there was this idea of having 12 of the best drummers in a room oh you know that's exciting I mean those were exciting mm -hmm. days of the pedal steel players you know Rush was really going back to my roots and and having just you know all I can say is you know I love how Ron embraced this whole sort of aesthetic of okay we're going to go and do an indie movie now you know, um, and it was really working with my old friends in England and then making it like a band. Um, and, and, and really, you know, like, like Russian 12 years and, 
a slave are movies which which are done really in, in a really intimate way. Um, I mean, Twelve Years a Slave is you know it's one cello, one violin. Um, this truly astonishingly fabulous composer, musician, brain, whatever, in Benjamin Wolfish who came um, on board. Um, you know, and myself playing the piano or whatever, <laughs> whatever it was, but you know, and, and Steve. And so it was this very private, very personal, very intimate setting to go and work on this movie, which um, at first, of course, I thought was impossible and impossible to do. And then, you know, just S Steve just comes into the room and he doesn't even have to say anything. He doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know what's right and what's wrong. And Joe Walker, his editor, uh, he was a, who's a you know, he's a great musician in his own right. He went to Royal College of Music. I mean, he's far more qualified than I am. <laughs> so, you know, you're having these conversations. And that's the part I find exciting. I mean, at the end of the day, um, yes, I still have a lot to prove to myself. There's that. Um, but on the other hand, the, the, the thing is, I, I just love the excitement of of being with, you know, working with other musicians. Mm -hmm. I think music comes alive when you have people play and chip in, and you know, and if you, if you have extraordinary musicians there, I mean, they really, you know, they, you know, Ridley used to say, you know, they give wings to my music. Mm -hmm. I mean, they give flight to it. Yes, that's mm -hmm. absolutely true. And so you try to surround yourself with these people and. I mean, this room is very much about that. Uh, mm -hmm. We just we just kick the furniture out, and, <laughs> you know. We sit down, and you know, I got sort of a tune written, and it, it it very quickly metamorphoses into something fairly amazing because of them, mm -hmm. not because of me. I owe everything to the musicians I work with. I owe everything to the writers and the cinematographers mm -hmm. because you know I I get such a sense of what the music should be from the cinematography, you know, the light, the light, the colors is everything. So is that to say that you always will see uh, footage before you write your music, or do you sometimes write and then they come up with the footage? No, I mean, you know, for instance, the way, well, the way we worked on Rush or the way we, I work with Chris Nolan is I, I work from the word and the conversation, and then... Um, you know, like like I spoke to Zach yesterday. He said, "You got to you got to come down to you know our bunker and see the artwork. You got to come down. You got to see what we're doing. You got to see the colors. You got to." That's know. for the next one. Yes. Yes. Next Man of Steel. Um, you know, like like Chris is working with a new DP, mm -hmm. and I started writing on Interstellar. I mean, I started writing quite a quite quite a while ago. Actually, mm -hmm. one of the things. I said to him, "You got to give me a color palette." I don't, you know, I don't know what it's, you know, and he goes, "I don't even know the color palette." <laughs> you know? Now, why is the color palette important to you for the music? Because you know, look, if you want to, if you want to be really boring and pedantic, you know, light and sound are the same thing. It's just a different part of the spectrum, right? So, um, just to me, you know, and I, I just feel that quite acutely that, you know. The wrong harmony, or the wrong chord, or the wrong inversion, or whatever, just doesn't work with a certain <laughs> color palette. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, the thin red line. I mean, we, we we discussed endlessly that there was going to be no red in the movie, mm. you know, and um, other than blood. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's a shot of poppies, and you know, and I'm freaking out at Terry, <laughs> going, you promised me, <laughs> you know, you well, know he, what are these puppies <laughs> doing there, you know. And, and, and just as a side <clears throat> off of that, I, my understanding is that that was uniquely challenging in another way too, which is that uh, didn't you do something like six and a half hours worth of music just before? I recorded six and a half yes. hours worth of music. Yes, and that was so that he could find within that what he wanted it to be? It's not just him, it's me too. And, you know, and, and it's like... You know, like, 
thin red line led me into a certain direction uh -huh. um, that I'd never gone in, uh, gone to before. And it's sort of a direction I keep exploring. I mean, thin red line and inception and um, twelve years a slave. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're stylistically aren't that dissimilar. You know, and it's it's a constant search for, like, the four notes. Mm. I don't know, the thing that, that you know, how can I, you know, there's the, the, the something at the tip of my tongue and I haven't quite figured out how to say it yet. And even uh, consciously, subconsciously, isn't there uh, an element of the Inception score that recurs in the 12 Years a Slave score? It's n not really. It's, it's. It's 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 stylistically uh -huh. yes uh -huh. you know I mean they're different notes but you know I'm trying to whittle away and 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 try to make things as translucent and as simple as I possibly uh -huh. can you know and yes it's 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 just a way of I mean um, you know trying to find a really clear and clean line uh -huh. into something you know that that I haven't quite been able to say. Well, when you're working on so many things, let's take this this year. You've got these four movies. There was there overlap on when you're working on them, and or do you finish one and then go on to the other? Do you? There's there's, there's overlap and stuff that I think about uh -huh. things, but um, there's not as much overlap as you think. Uh -huh. um, like I, I, we finished Man of Steel, sort of way ahead of schedule somehow, because it's it was just a very you know, um, this is just just people who knew what they were doing, and you know there was no panicking, and that you know it, it's you want to work with people who know how to commit, know how to say yes, and know how to say no, and then things move really smoothly. You know, you don't want to work with people who change their mind a lot. I mean, I do that enough when I'm sitting there. I mean. Um, you know, the, the the only reason I'm saying, no, there isn't a, you know, the, there isn't as much overlap between Inception and 12 Years a Slave as you think, because I remember sitting there for ever mm -hmm. finding those Inception notes, and then I sat there forever finding, <laughs> you know, within that vocabulary, mm -hmm. you know, within that style, um, a bunch of notes for 12 Years a Slave. But, you know, they are different. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And because it, we're, we're, they're different because we're telling a different story, and we're telling it from a different angle and from a different sensibility. So, on average, what is the span of a period that you work on a score generally? I try to make it longer and longer. I mean, as I said, I started on Interstellar in January. Um, and, and so no, 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 and then I sort of put it aside, yeah. you know. Um, you know, now, now I'm in the middle of Spider-Man, and then as soon as I finish Spider-Man, you know, I think all I'm going to do um, for most of next year is work on Interstellar. You wow. know, and, I, and I, I'm not even looking at anything else right now. It's just, um, I just want to really throw myself into it. And is that because you feel a particular... Um, responsibility with a Christopher Nolan score. I mean, you guys have a great history now between the Dark Knight movies and Inception, and it's almost like I think everyone who goes to those movies would, would say they're maybe, uh, you know, that maybe they come out with a greater appreciation of the role of music in a film than they would have from other movies. That's because Chris just turns the music up too loud. <laughs> uh, no, it's, no, 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 I don't think, uh, no, no, first of all, it's, it's, I just like I just like work. I like hanging out with him. Mm -hmm. I like talking to him. I, you know, I like, and I, I, you know, I mean, and you know what we talk about? We talk about our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we we talk about paintings. We mm -hmm. talk about all sorts of things. You know, and then sometimes we talk a little about the movie. <laughs> um, we talk about things we like. You mm -hmm. know, we I think. I think we like each other's company. And how did that relationship first 
begin the, with the two of you? Well, he phoned me up and said, would I do, would I meet with him about Batman Begins? And um, really, honestly, I was, I didn't really want to do Batman Begins, you know, um, because I didn't know how to do this thing of he's one person by night and, you know, the Jekyll and Hyde aspect uh -huh. of that. You know, and, and there was Chris's idea, actually, who said, you know, well, you know, why don't you, why don't you do it with somebody else? You know, do, do, do it with a colleague, you know. And I thought, oh, great, uh, great. And um, Tim Seaton Howard and I had always been, uh, always talked about maybe doing something together. Because it's this, it's this musician thing, mm -hmm. you know. We both come from playing in bands, and suddenly we're composers. <laughs> and we sit in a room all by ourselves for, the mo for most of our <laughs> life. And... You know, whenever we get together, you know, we start playing. It's fun. It's great. It's you know, it's 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 what music's all about. And so I asked James if he would go and, um, you know, just come on this sort of adventure. And and I mean, he uh, huge chunks of um, Batman Begins are uh, James. You know, in in anything that displays any sensitivity and any grace and any beauty is James. How do two, or more than two, in some cases I know you've had more than that some, uh, how do multiple composers uh, work on a film together? Do you Are you there together for everything? We, or do we, you... are we, on, on Batman Begins, we were truly together on everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it literally would be like, you know, James would be playing something, you know, like my hand would come through, the, and no, oh, what about this note, you know? <laughs> and so everything was influenced by everybody else, but I realized... So quite early on, I think he realized it too. And uh, we, I mean, we we never really spoke about it. But you know, I was heading towards the dark side. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so 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 by the time it came to do Dark Knight, you know, I I totally embraced you know all the the dark <laughs> stuff. Um, you know, and then. Chris systematically killed off all of James's characters as well, you know, so um, <laughs> I was left holding the baby, as it were, by right. the third one. Um, but, you know, look, James had laid down all these ground rules before we started working, you know, not in a didactic mm -hmm, way, but mm -hmm. just, you know, he was explaining to me his process. Just he gets up early at the studio by 7 o'clock in the evening he's done you know uh, he needs to take a weekend off etc you know and so we both arrived in London we had oh yeah the other thing was you know and he needed a soundproof room and you know you can't listen while he's experimenting mm -hmm. and you know and he'll tell you when he's ready so we both arrive in London we have studios facing each other with soundproof room <laughs> uh, with soundproof doors um I think the first evening we got home at one o'clock in the morning and after a week the the doors were just always <laughs> open and, you know, at three o'clock in the morning I'd be sitting there going, come on, James, can we go home now? Because <laughs> you generally are a late night exactly. worker, right? You know, and, and, and it was just, you know, no, I wasn't leading him astray. It was just exciting and yeah. it was just fun and it was just like um, full of energy. How do you know when you're done with a score? Um, we had one more session on Dark Knight Rises and it was like really late at night I think it was at, like we'd worked all day and this was like at 10, 10 p.m. till 1 a.m. right one of those My God. and I'm sitting on the couch and I'm thinking I think I'm going to collapse <laughs> I think I'm going to fade but I've got this smile on my face you know <laughs> But, you know, the orchestra is tuning up and I can't get from the couch to the console to start actually giving them directions because I'm sitting on this couch and I'm going to collapse now. <laughs> and I see Chris looking over at me and I smile. And he gets up and he goes over to the mixing console and he presses the talk back and he says to the orchestra, I think we've recorded enough. And I'm going, no, no, we still have to do, you know, like all sorts of unimportant things. And he goes, no, I think we've done enough. And I think he saved my life. <laughs> you know, he 
he, he, you know, he, you know, he, I think part of why, you know, it's never perfect. And, um, and it's not about, oh, it's good enough. But it's like, you know, this is as good as I could make it at this moment in my life. Uh -huh. um, but hey, wait, there is more. There is more life. There's another movie. There's another story I get to tell. You know, and that's why um, it's really important for me to work on, on, on different, you know, very different projects because you know, a man of steel and twelve years a slave couldn't be more no. different in, in one, you know one sense or the other. But you know, do you, do you always want to eat steak? <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 no, do you know he's... what I mean? So, so it's really, you know, it's it's important and it's important to work with different people. And, and you know, and the more you know, the older I get, I realize that really what I want to do is I want to work with the people that I adore and that I love. You know, you want to work with your friends. Uh -huh. and you want to um, do that because partly why, why are they your friends? Because the stories they, they are compelled to tell are stories that resonate with uh -huh. you. Um, so, you know, look, look Steve McQueen and I wanted, you know, we, we wanted to work together sort of forever. Uh -huh. It's just, you know, timing. Uh -huh. You know, timing didn't work out. Which might answer your question about, you know, do I have things always piling up and do I multitask well? I don't multitask well. Uh -huh. You know, I I mean, you know, t 12 Years a Slave is very disciplined. And, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's the notes I leave out that make it good. Absolutely, yeah. You know, um, and, you know, it's very much about ser really, truly serving this film, serving the performances, serving Steve's vision, serving, um, you know, the subtext and the text of the story, you know, and, and, and at the same time trying to find a way of having a little bit of me in it. The last things that I hope I can quickly bother you with. These are just very sort of first thing that comes to you questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, I wanted to ask you about this location. What is the history of this location? Why do you, what, what is it, what is within it and, and why is it so productive for you? So conducive to productivity for well, you? Well, um, the location, well, next door is Jackson Brown studio. And one day I was recording at Jackson Brown studio and I saw there was a, warehouse for sale next door so <laughs> but hey you know pl plus you know everybody said we're, we're mad you know guys you want to do hollywood movies why are you moving to santa monica you need to be in hollywood <laughs> um but i thought the air was better <laughs> um and so we moved down here and then jerry brockheimer came by and he saw what we were doing he's going oh this is this is really cool mm -hmm. so he opened his office and then james newton howard came and um Michael Bay is just around the corner. So, so it became this, you know, J.J. Abrams, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's become this little community, uh -huh. you know, Hollywood West. And you and um, you spend so many hours here, it's got to be somewhere you feel at home, I guess, right? It, it, not just me, but, you know, I, it really came from working with Tim Brooks on As Good As It Gets. I had no idea how to... I was really banging my head against the wall, and the wall wasn't giving, <laughs> um, of how to solve the Jack Nicholson character. Uh -huh. And, you know, I finally fessed up to Jim. I said, look, Jim, I got nothing. So what are you doing this weekend? Do you want to just come over and we just look at things and I just plonk around on the piano? And, uh, you know, it's still the same couch, actually. It's Jim's couch, <laughs> but it's still there. Um, and it was, you know, it was supposed to be one day, but it turned into like three or four days. It was Jim sitting on the couch and just me getting over the sort of, I don't know, you know, fear everybody has of creating in front of somebody. Uh -huh. But, you know, in a funny way, that's what musicians do. You know, we, when we improvise, you know, and I come from 
improvised music, you oh, know. Wow. Just take a deep breath, plant your feet firmly on the ground, and you go. Huh. Um, and so Jim and I, we figured out, you know, how to approach a character. Um, and so the space became very much about that, you know, that, that it, you know, and, and it's big enough that musicians can, can come in and we can just try things. Uh -huh. um, and then the, 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 you know, what surrounds my room are many other composers, young composers. Um, I, yeah, I'm now the old, I'm, I'm the old guy now. <laughs> um, but it, it, it wasn't like that. It, it was always just this collective of ideas and musicians helping each other out. And, you know, somebody plays really good guitar, even though they happen to be a film composer. I mean, like, Ramin Javadi is a really good guitarist. Junkie XL, who just did 300 for Zach. I mean, um, I didn't even know he could play. You know, I'm, I'm plonking some bass line. And I, I think the notes are good, but it's sounding pathetic. And he just sort of goes, here, give me that. <laughs> and suddenly my notes, you know... Came to life, um, yeah came to life so it's it's this sort of thing that you know we can ask each other we can influence each other we can help each uh -huh. other and I think I think the greatest help in a funny way is just psychologically that you're not so you're not so alone with your demons uh -huh. Uh -huh. um was walking down this corridor you see somebody else with that look in their eyes of sheer terror <laughs> and you go but hang on this guy's really good uh -huh. you know he knows what he's doing right you know, he'll solve it, I'll solve it. You know, we'll also figure it out. You have been recognized with, I think, virtually every award a, a film composer can receive, and yet you've said, and I, I read this quote, uh, quote, I, I so couldn't care less about awards, close quote, and you even withdrew your name for from consideration for the Oscar a few years ago, and I just wonder, um, I, I, it, how did you come to feel that way? Because I had to, because it's how, how long an answer do you want? You know, for me, the the thing is the process, working with people, the, doing the music, working with the musicians, and then that sort of magic moment when you show it to you know when you show it to a real mm -hmm. audience for the first time, you know, and wow, it communicates, it resonates, it's you know that's great. Um, so that that's that's thrilling. But I remember, you know, Lion King um, winning the Oscar, walking down there, getting up on that stage, being terrified of having to speak in public. You know, I get really bad stage fright. Mm -hmm. um, but I look out there, you know, and, and everybody's applauding and everybody's happy, and it's like, and, and I feel this wave of adoration coming towards me. And the devil in me says, ooh, this feels pretty good. <laughs> and the devil goes, if you write pretty music like that again, you can maybe come back, you know, and get another one of those little gold things. And I remember exactly when this voice in my head said, and there lies ruin, you know? And that's what it is, you know? It's like, if that's what you want, mm -hmm. you're going to, you know... It's all over, uh -huh. you know, and, and, you know, we don't need to name names. In fact, I, I can't even think of a name, but I know sort of in the periphery of my vision, you know, I mean, I, you know, people who've made, you know, people we think of as great artists with great integrity who sort of somehow make fools of themselves uh -huh. when they're up there, uh -huh. up there, uh -huh. right? Because it's, 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 uh, you know... You have to remember, we filmmakers, we're, you know, forget, not the, I'm not talking about the actors, the uh -huh. actors know how to do this, but, you know, us backroom boys, right? <laughs> um, we're like a shy little lot that just sits there in our little rooms, and we're not glamorous or anything like this. We just, we just like the work, uh -huh. you know, we just like the craft, we just like the, you know, you know, rolling up our sleeves and you know, so, so when you you put us out there, we don't quite know how to defend ourselves. Uh -huh. um, and, it, you know, 
it's 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 so easy to buy into into the wrong part. It really is because it's seductive, mm -hmm. you know. So it's so uh, it's important. It's important to be aware of the you know to not make the Faustian pact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, and, and and let me just say something about that sure. Oscar night. Yes. So, yeah, it was seductive, but I did find my bearings. But I did go out and I went to every party, and um, you know, and and the thing wasn't quite mine. I would leave it on tables, and and, and waiters would you say, "Hang, I think you forgot this, mm -hmm. etc." And I was out until I don't know, five, six in the morning. It was <laughs> thrilling, and then I came in here, you know, and I had a meeting with Tony and Jerry and Don. You know, on the movie we were working on, you know, I played them the first piece of music and they went, I don't think this works. <laughs> and it was, boff, yeah, we're back, back to you know, Earth, we're right? back to Earth, <laughs> you know. And weirdly, I don't think this works. It's much more interesting than winning some, or getting adoration or whatever. I don't think this works mm -hmm. means, ooh, there's a problem. Problems are interesting. Oh, we can go and invent something. Mm -hmm. We better, you know, let's 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 bring the A game yeah. to this one. The last question, I promise, sure. is uh, when you, as a as a, as a, I know you say you're not not necessarily an official student of music, but as a student of somebody who knows the history of music in movies and uh, can appreciate it probably better than just about anyone. What are the most iconic? film scores that, that you have heard, the ones that people will still be talking about 100 years from now, and part B, which of the Hans Zimmer scores, the many of them, stands the best shot of being among them? And I, I know that you will uh, try to give a humble answer, but I want you to be honest. Like if I think that anyone objective would count you among the best of the best, so which so which would be among that lot once you once you identify it? Right. I think I'm a legend in my own lunchtime, but <laughs> as, far, as far as it goes. No, uh, okay, best best film music. I want to change my mind on this on a daily basis. Um, but there's some con uh, there's some consistent ones. Think this is not best. This is the ones I love. Perfect. Right? Um, Ennio Morricone, Once Upon a Time in America, Randy Newman, Avalon. Which I actually listened to again yesterday. <laughs> just, just had this urge. Mm -hmm. Gotta listen to Avalon again. Um, John Barry Quiller memorandum and um, any of his Bond things. Um, John Williams Close Encounters. Weirdly, he didn't say Superman or he didn't say <laughs> Star Wars. No, Close Encounters to me is as good a piece of concert music as the 20th century has produced, huh. you know? So, and I think, because every, everybody fixates on da-da-da-da-da. It's like, like every, everybody fixates on, you know, and I, I just went through this, you know, the the Superman fanfare or mm -hmm. Star Wars main theme or the Raiders mm -hmm. march, da-da-da-da. It's what happens after that. It's not the big popular hook where you go, my God, John Williams is a genius. You know, it's the stuff which is maybe less hooky and less harmable, but is great art. You know, um, anything Henry Mancini ever did. Mm -hmm. um, great art. Giorgio Moroda, Midnight Express. The first time I saw it, I, listen, I didn't know you could do that. I <laughs> didn't know, you, you know, you could do film music in mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. um, Vangelis, Chariot of, Chariots of Fire. I mean, I'm just sort of firing off the top of my head. Um, the Dam Busters March. Uh, you know, if you if you you know if you ever want to have fun, you know, there's like a Ennio Morricone greatest hits double album, and every tune is great. Mm -hmm. You know, isn't a single bad tune. Lalo Schifrin, you know, I mean, just revolutionary stuff. Um, Chemical Brothers, Hannah, I think is fantastic. Uh, Johnny Greenwood, you know, just, 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 you know, give me another. There, there will be blood. Yeah. You know, um, 
So I'm, you know, Trent Reznor. Yeah. You know, I'm, it's moving forward. Mm-hmm. It's it's always expanding. And now the tough part, though, a hundred years from now, which Hans Zimmer score is the one that people are going to still be talking about the most? I don't know. Um, or which I, which I you know, say. you know, here's a cool thing. Yeah. In a hundred years, I won't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think Thin Red Line is is good work. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's good work. Um, I think we. I know we changed the landscape with the Batman trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people are sick of it. I think people are sick of that style. They want something new. Um, I, I. I don't. You know. I, you wouldn't say Inception. Yeah, Inception's yeah. good. Inception's good. Inception was great because it was a great experience. So it was really. It was. It's very hard for me to say, "Oh, this is good music," and separate it from the experience. Yes. You know, um, I think both Gladiator and Hannibal. I don't know. I, I when Ridley first started doing Hannibal, I said to him, "You know, I I want to treat this as a romantic comedy." I, he sort of he has a way of sort of cocking his eyebrow, <laughs> which goes, "Oh yeah, really." Um, and I actually think it's pretty good. I mean, I think it turned out pretty oh, well. Yeah. Um, the pirate stuff is just because people love... Pl- you know you know what I love about pirates is um, a lot of school orchestras play it. And I think, I think there's something great about... Because I had such a miserable time with my music lessons. Mm-hmm. And I like that I've written some music that kids actually like playing. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's that's why I like that. I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not. I can't comment on the quality of no. the music. I can just talk about, you know, if you like playing it, then there must be something to it. Uh-huh. Um, it's it's a it's a weird thing, this music thing, because you know, I I write music, and now we live in this the day and age of the internet, where uh-huh. you know you're flooded. With information, mm-hmm. you're flooded with. You, you see what's out there. I mean, I really noticed this. You know, by the time we got to the third Batman, mm-hmm. um, you know, you 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 feel what the fans are feeling, and they're not anonymous anymore. And so, so suddenly you find you're having these. Your music is having this rather sort of intimate conversation with somebody you've never met, but it is nonetheless some weird dialogue you're having um, and I, I love that about what we do um, you touch people's hearts you provoke them, you make them angry you, you make them laugh you know um, I don't know, I mean League of Their Own made them laugh yeah. I mean, Penny, Penny said to me um, she overheard this kid at a ball game. Oh no! At, at the movie, mm-hmm. um, coming out of the movie, saying to his dad, "Hey, if they played music like this at ball games, I would, I would much, I would really love to go and see baseball." Well. <laughs> you know, that's thought, great. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough for. I don't know. First of all, for all the dozens of hours of uh, music that I've enjoyed, and and for this, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Look. Writing the music has been a pleasure, you know, and working, as I said, working with these musicians has been a great life. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.